Okay, a thumbs up. Um, yeah, hi guys. Um, welcome to this science chat. We're um, at the 11th one already. Um, and it's actually 1st of June, which would have been the last day of the Balkan River tour. And we would have been doing science chats along this whole tour um, with people and connecting to the locals and connecting to scientists along the way. Never happened because we're not allowed to travel, um, but still an important day actually especially what's happening in Slovenia now. We'll be zooming into that a bit later with um, three students that have been doing their master thesis. Um, but first I'll be introducing to Sean, because um, he's um, from Croatia and he's an ichthyologist. And many more parts of biology, you'll have to tell it a bit yourself. Um, but he's been doing a lot of research in his whole career and research that has been proving that rivers um, might be better or free-flowing but he's got some uh, interesting insights in it and he's going to tell us a bit of a different concept of looking at rivers instead of only looking at how much energy there is in the hydro potential of it for instance but I'm um, looking at how much energy there is in the river in principle. Um, I think we're just going to start with that so Dushan is going to share his screen with us and he's going to do a presentation of 15 maybe 20 minutes um, and then there's going to be a bit of time for questions and then after that, we'll head over to Ombelin, Constant, and Mike, who are going to talk through their research a bit with us, which was about the Sava. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to just ask after the presentation or write them in the chat and then we'll be asking them. Yeah, cool. Dushan, stage is yours. Okay, so let me... Hello to everybody. So yes, I will then uh, turn on the sharing. Let me... Okay. Yeah, are we starting? No? Okay. Okay. Uh, so do you see it now? Yeah? Okay. So and also if if uh, if I am not loud enough, please just tell me. I have this new headphones that I just got. 10 minutes ago. So actually I have no idea how you hear me or, or do you hear me? So just shout or something. Yeah, if it's if it's too loud. Also if I'm like screaming and you are like at home trying to put it down. So, um, so I will be speaking about uh, river energy and this is something uh, that uh, I got uh, quite interested through our work with the WWF. And uh, so the main thing in Croatia was that, uh, of course, we had a huge interest in these uh, uh, rivers, especially these karst rivers that are uh, really beautiful and blue-green color and uh, mainly the nature around them is really nicely preserved. But, of course, the, the continental rivers in Croatia as well, the huge rivers. So, and uh, we actually started to work work on this through fish and you'll see that fish will be some of my main uh, examples and, and, and how we actually got into the essence but uh, I, you can see also that the, the subtitle is science or evidence-based activism. So in a sense what, what I noticed um, is that uh, very often you have some interested party like investor who is saying oh we want to build this or that in, in a certain place and they usually speak about you know biodiversity it's nothing very important in this site and they speak i would say rubbish uh, um, they don't actually want any real-time data but then on the other hand we also notice that very often the people who would be fighting against all that would also have no concrete evidence about what they are saying so like just saying that the river is uh, you know high in biodiversity but actually when you are called upon to give the list of all the species that occur or like uh, are these populations important in a national or european level then you are like oh but we don't have it that you know well done so actually we found that there is a very strong need for science and evidence to be put into this uh, influencing and lobbying uh, to protect uh, rivers. So we actually found that we are maybe the good source of this kind of data. So we are in our institute, we are scientists and actually we, we uh, work 
work on, on nature conservation anyway, but actually we are very, very bad in lobbying. So like science and, and any kind of political or lobbying uh, uh, or activism really don't work. So usually scientists don't know how to speak to people. Uh, but they have really cool results and, and evidence to protect some area. So we combine this and actually now it functions in a way that we provide evidence, uh, real-time data and an interpretation for people who are actually very good in that. So like uh, WWF or Riverwatch or, or any other interested party or even the government when they are interested to, to hear what we have to say. And uh, actually, so... We all know that uh, the migration of, of fish and, uh, and, and actually all the animals uh, occurs around the world and, and these uh, rivers, they are the, the main highways of life. So actually it's not just about the fish, but actually the fish are a kind of uh, icon that can actually, or like um, a, a flagship, some flagship species that we can use because then people understand if you speak about a sturgeon that can leap up to a hundred years and like grow to 1000 kilograms then people are really really uh, interested but if you are speaking about plankton or something then they are like so um, actually we we try to celebrate even this world fish migration day and then i i encourage and invite everybody because it's a really good way of, of promoting uh, the the rivers i would start off the the maybe my story is uh, through different levels of this kind of migration and to understand that it's not just about building huge dams in huge rivers because migration happen in really really large scale of, of uh, uh, geographical scale so we have this uh, species of atipenseride these are sturgeons and you have from the size of uh, 1000 kilo um, uh, huso huso, so it's a beluga sturgeon which grows to enormous and it's one of the uh, sizes and one of the biggest uh, freshwater fish uh, up to smaller species but in, mainly in Europe there is at least five or six species that are uh, critically endangered or extinct so actually these species are a real good example of what uh, a stopping of migration can do uh, to biodiversity and then we have uh, Salmonidae, so these are species that don't travel to such, for migration to such a huge distance. So sturgeons, they actually go through uh, from the sea into the uh, fresh water and actually go to the uppermost areas of, of the rivers. And then we have this, um, the family of trouts, which actually are more maybe localized and they have migrations that are up to a few hundred kilometers, but not so big as sturgeons but again if you cut off in these small streams even with small hydropower plants if you stop this smaller migration again some individuals cannot uh, just uh, pass through this kind of um, uh, stops and uh, actually their breeding places are usually the highest most points of the of the small streams so they just don't prefer to breed where there is other uh, where there are other fish present and then on the even smaller scale, you would have uh, these strange looking things for the ones who are not ichthyologists. Uh, so actually this is not a fish, basically it's a lamprey, uh, but actually we work with them same as if they are uh, fish. So uh, lampreys actually are the cleaners of, of these ecosystems. So actually they uh, go and they, either, uh, they are either parasitic on the fish when they are adults, but when they are juveniles, they feed on organic matter in the mud and their juveniles and, and the adults are so different. Actually, at some point they were considered different species. So juveniles mainly live in the mud and, and in the lower parts of the rivers. But then as they grow older, they have to migrate upstream and the adults, because they are very sensitive uh, to predation, they have to go to this uppermost places where like maybe one or two centimeters of water is present and they breed in this kind of waters because there is no predators there. Uh, and then we have uh, in the even smaller uh, uh, scale uh, some fish species that actually just need to migrate up a few hundred meters. And this is one really cool uh, example. It's a new species that we recently described. It's called Alburnus sava. Uh, and actually it's called Sava River Bleak. Uh, 
and actually it is already almost extinct since the description. Uh, the problem is that these are the type of this is the type of species that actually lives under uh, in the in the deep parts of the rivers, and then during the uh, spawning, it needs to get into this like uh, really fast flowing parts of the river under uh, waterfalls or like in uh, natural underneath natural barriers uh, to breed. Uh, and this is actually the, exactly the type of the habitat where you would uh, find people interested in uh, building small hydropower plants. And you will see in the example later that it really is like that. So what, when we are speaking about um, energy of, of a certain river, of course, first you consider the energy of the flow. And this is what everybody is considering when they are speaking about uh, will they do some uh, some uh, uh, hydropower plant in in the in the rivers but the point of energy is actually all the energy that the river has and in one sense i'm speaking even in the geographical sense so like this is the drava river uh, in, uh some 120 years ago so you can see that there is lots of these side channels and really well structured heterogeneity is really really uh, uh strong so you can find lots of different habitats here the energy of this system is huge it's like a sponge that collects water organic matter everything and then only 50 years later uh, you already have this situation and very often you can find these very old maps uh, for free online and you can check for exact location how it actually looked 100 years ago these are the austro-hungarian maps of the of, of the area and then you have today already completely different situation and there is two hydropower plants that were built. They are marked as these red uh, triangles here. And you can see that uh, this blue part is the river itself. And actually the whole space where the river was actually uh, with the embankments put into one straight line and actually most of the energy of this uh, ecosystem was lost. So what we are looking today is actually uh, maybe 10, 20% of what was there. And actually we are looking at the part of Drava River that is today considered as the Amazon of, the, of Europe, actually like one of the most pristine areas in Europe. So actually this is one of the best examples, not the worst. And you can see what kind of change there was. Uh, <clears throat> but if we go to a micro scale, so the energy of the river is something like this. So if you have a system that was changed for, for using for hydropower uh, energy, you are actually exchanging it for the reduction of ecosystem energy. So from these two images, I mean, it is like two uh, very opposite things, but it encompasses the idea that I'm speaking about. So uh it is not that you are uh considering that hydro energy can come out of anything uh anything like just flowing of the of the river it's actually about everything it's about all the energy that this kind of ecosystem can encompass uh only if you consider that uh what is the um, uh, amount of uh carbon that is fixated in one image or in the other you can imagine how much energy was lost in between these two kind of uh, habitats. And uh, here is another example. So if you look at a natural type of uh, uh, river, so underneath here, you would see what kind of components it has. And each part of this ecosystem is actually its energy. So if you have a duck and the duck dies, it will flow down to the bottom of this lake and actually the small invertebrates and the bacteria will actually tear it apart in this uh, hipporaic zone. And actually they will build this energy back through their bodies and back into the fish and then the fish back into the top predators and, and, and stuff like this. So if you look up here, you will see this uh, gray zone, which is marked as a hipporaic zone. And actually all of that zone, those are like a small or bigger rocks and sediments and all the water that is contained in between. And then all the organisms that live in that as well. But actually all of that is the source of food and energy for the whole river that you actually see. 
So what happens is when uh, you have a healthy ecosystem, this heporeic zone is actually full of, of biodiversity, full of energy, and actually very easily can feed the fish or, or any uh, type of animal up in the river where you see it. But when you have some kind of even uh, type of habitat with, where uh, you have side arms are actually closed or you have embankments, or even in the worst case scenario, you have uh, concrete walls or concrete bottom, which is also present in some places. You can imagine that then this hipporaic zone actually doesn't exist. So hipporaic is actually gone. And actually there is nothing to feed the biodiversity up in the river where you do see it. And this is what we call the loss of, of the river energy when you have this kind of changes. It doesn't happen just uh, when you build a barrier. It happens whatever you do to the ecosystem. So if you make an uh, artificial river and you put rocks in this, uh, let's say, river, and you put the water flowing through the river, you will still not get 20 fish per square meter as you would in the natural uh, habitat because in the natural habitat the energy of the ecosystem will allow for 20 fish to feed but in the artificial it will not and uh, if we consider so the energy is of the of the river is composed of the water flowing through the river but also all of this biodiversity that is sucked in as as I said it functions like a sponge it collects water and biodiversity and holds it in one place and in each part of the river as we go downstream it's the same so if you have a fish in this lower part of the stream it depends on the on the energy of the river on the even on the higher areas so like on the drift of the energy and this is something that uh, I speak about. This is a Zermania river down in the uh, Adriatic part of Croatia, where if you dig up to four meters down into these uh, rocks, actually it's still water and, and full of animals. So actually the river is not 20 centimeters deep, as you can see it here. It's more than four or five meters deep here. So if you have a huge trout living here, it can survive on the energy of the river here. But in the artificial channel where the depth is only 20 centimeters or 30 centimeters, it cannot. Even if it's two meters deep, it still doesn't have energy that it needs. So with this, we come to this question that very often we are being asked and then uh, especially for this kind of expert opinions and especially when we come into the end play and that's on the court and then as, as like an expert, you are asked, would you consider that this is a, a renewable source or that the small hydropower plants are actually a renewable source of energy and, and uh, why actually would we consider it not? Because it's only using the amount of water that passes for a certain place. So actually we don't hold that water permanently. We actually let the water go and it again circulates. Yes, with this energy, potential energy of water, it is renewable. But from the point of biodiversity and the, the river energy, it's not renewable because in long term you had to destroy the energy of the ecosystem. And mainly the fact is that the areas in the this, uh, retention lakes and, and uh, accumulation lakes looks like this. So actually there is nothing living there. And even if you go into this, this is like uh, one of the accumulation lakes here in Croatia. If you look at the bottom, there is no plants. There is actually no animals down there. And if you dig, even 20 centimeters under this uh, sediment, it's actually black and completely anoxic. So actually it really doesn't have any energy. Or like this, if you have a concrete uh, uh, shores, then it's even, even more simple case. So actually how to react, of course, there are solutions. And, and uh, one of the things that uh, is possible is of course to invest in other types of uh, energy. I don't promote any of them, but actually you can see that conventional hydropower plant is now definitely overgrown by wind and solar. So in any case, there will probably in the future be ma many more other solutions that, that will have better usage of, of energy than, than hydropower um, plants. Okay, so now I will tell you a little bit about concrete cases where we worked and where you can see how actually stupid the humankind can be. Uh, the point is that if you use a certain area and you create something that will destroy the energy of the ecosystem, so you have 
a few people that will get the, the, the benefits of it and financial benefits in, in prime, but then you have a huge amount of people who will have negative side effects. And one of the, the worst cases that I ever worked was this hydro uh, power plant, uh, Ombla, and it was supposed to be built inside a huge rock. It's like, a, uh, you can see here, it was supposed to be an underground uh, hydro power plant. So this, what you are looking in this area is actually, they were supposed to put concrete into the rock to close it underground and actually raise the level of this uh, lower source here for about 90 meters. So they were saying, but you know, nobody will see it. It will all be underground. So actually what's the problem? But the thing is that actually in this cave system, we have really a huge biodiversity. Uh, and you can see here, it's a little bit maybe bad picture, but you can see how it looks. So they, the, actually the flooding was supposed to be inside the, the, the mountain up to, almost to the, the top level of, the, of, the, of, this, of this area. And this is the only source of fresh water in the whole county. Uh, and so the whole county depends on this water source. And also we have some endemic species that only occur in this area. One of them being this small species of semi-cave fish. And actually it was described as, as a semi-cave uh, species that only occurs in the internal parts of the, of the system. And then we, have, uh, we had uh, many examples where this kind of cases, so we would give a scientific elaboration, we would hand it over to the people who could lobby about it, but then you would have news titles like this. Uh, I will translate it because uh, it's in Croatian, but it says like small fish in the course of uh, human development or uh, a fish like this, which is less than like a thumb, will stop a multi-billion uh, investment. And people really get annoyed about that. But, and, and then of course they start to attack uh, towards uh, our, the experts and saying like, ah, oh, you know, you only want to stop everything. But then when you describe, actually they do understand. Then we told them, but you know, actually this whole project here, the whole accumulation lake was supposed to destroy 100% of the population. And not just that, but actually the whole lake was supposed to be done for uh, irrigation, for agriculture in area where there is no registered agricultural, uh, well, any need for agricultural watering. So it was like a project that was supposed to be done just to be done. So just to spend lots of money and of course it's uh, government's money or EU funds and so on and so on. Uh, and at the end, actually, the people turned on them and said, really, but actually nobody here wants to, wants to do this. Actually, it's for who you are actually putting this kind of huge accumulation lake. And you can see here, we did uh, some really precise maps. We tried to locate uh, down here uh, where actually this species lives. And the, gre the green uh, points are the places where the animal lives in mainly in small springs. Uh, and in, uh, in the underground. And actually this, uh, or, or this uh, area here, uh, reddish area, is actually where the accumulation lake would be found. So actually it would cover it completely. There would definitely be no surviving uh, animals, especially because they occur in these small karstic streams and not in lakes. And then uh, we had uh, as well sometimes cases where actually it couldn't be stopped in Croatia and it couldn't be stopped in some uh, local uh, complaints. So we had to complain to the European Commission. And actually with this example of Little Bregana River, so actually in 2010, it looked like this. Uh, and again, we started to do population ecology in this river on one species of this endemic fish, which is only found in whole Croatia, found only here. Uh, and actually we started to do this population ecology to come next year and actually to find this. And as soon as we found this, uh, actually we uh, contacted uh, authorities. This was already in uh, 2000 and, uh, 12 or 13, so after Croatia entered the European Union. And actually this site was uh, pronounced as Natura 2000 site for that species that we found. And we come and actually the Croatian Water Management Agency 
actually destroy the whole river. And we called the Croatian ministry, the ministry sent the inspection, the inspector came and said, okay, I will close the construction, you have to stop with the working, but you can now start the process of uh, nature impact assessment which is actually impossible. You cannot start the nature impact assessment after the process is already done. You need to do that before and then see if you are allowed or not. So actually the ministry was the one that actually was trying to cover up the other governmental agency. And we had no other option but to complain to the, the European Commission. Uh, especially because a few days later we come here and as I said the inspector said they have to close the site and they cannot do any more construction so we come in a few days and it looks like this so actually we call him again and the inspector now comes again and sees that actually they didn't even close the site but just finished with the work and and moved on uh, so at that point, again, the inspector doesn't give them any kind of uh, fine or anything, but again calls them to just start the nature impact assessment. And, uh, well, I will cut the, short, the story short. Actually, the European Commission did force Croatian government to actually restore the whole river. Uh, it did take some time, but we didn't want to go back on this. And actually, we insisted. And at the end, the, the Brigana River had to be restored. And uh, actually, there was not a very easy way how to restore this kind of habitat because for this fish, it's important to have these like deeper parts and then some really shallow ones. And it has to be very hetero, you know, heterogeneous. So it's not possible that you just dig the deeper parts and then leave some very shallow ones because as the water comes, it will fill all the deeper ones and everything will just be flat. So we came up with this kind of uh, uh, approach. We would put up these boulders. These are one ton boulders. And uh, they were put be on the side of the river where actually the only place where the truck could bring them. And we would leave it to the nature to actually with next flood to cut the river. And after, uh, uh, well, also to mention in this area here, we actually had to install like a barrier because the Sava River, this is Sava River down there, uh, actually is a bit lower than uh, Bregana River here. So we, this is actually a barrier that actually like uh, a step, which uh, the Bregana River is around one and a half meter higher than Sava River. And the Croatian Water Management Agency told us that this is impossible. If you put this kind of rocks here, the water will just take them with next flood into Sava River. Well, I can tell you that now after uh, six years it's still there and this is how it looks now actually the we still we again have this heterogeneous habitat and uh, the the fish started to come back and they are very very numerous in this kind of deep parts in between the huge boulders and and rocks um to Sean, real quickly um, i'm gonna interrupt you a little bit it would be cool if we can wrap up so we have some time for oh, questions yeah, 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 yeah. Also? let's go quickly so uh, another case was with this, the fish I mentioned, so I'll not repeat again. So we described a new fish species, but it was located on the only place, uh, on one, only from one locality. And as soon as we, this is the original habitat, but when we came back, actually it was turned into a barrier and a small hydropower plant was established there. So actually the only habitat of the, of the species was destroyed. So the WWF uh, was interested in uh, trying to go and, and pursue this. So we used our uh, sonar imaging equipment to actually uh, record the, all, the whole upper part of the river. And uh, the point is that uh, they claim that the, the barrier will not raise the water level above the, the, the barrier uh, uh, at all. So it will just like be a barrier to just point the water into the small hydropower plant. So we did the sonars, uh, uh, sonar imaging and actually created a map like this where every few kilometers you can actually see uh, that the old waterfalls that were previously waterfalls and this fish was present there are now under two or three meters of water. So actually it's a, a very concrete evidence that they didn't obey uh, the, the licenses that they already had. So what to do? I would say in God we trust and all others bring data. Uh, I would 
incentive everybody who has any kind of, uh, you know, expert or scientific uh, uh, experience to actually start collecting data because there is somebody who really needs that, that data. But actually, we cannot all be scientists and we cannot all be uh, activists and we cannot all be lawyers or whatever. So, but in this case, we can build up a case very firm case when somebody who does work in, in like a, with a, a, a lawsuits and stuff can actually uh, push it through. And of course, what would you choose uh, for your relaxation, for your holiday? And at the end, the, the benefits of ecosystem in long term through uh, tourism, through all the other uh, services that you can get. Uh, on, on your left, you have a place where definitely nobody would go for any kind of relaxation and here you have of course a place where everybody would probably go <laughs> so and yeah that's it i will wrap up and uh, we can uh, if there is any questions please ask i will just close this let me need so we can see each other again thanks to jean that was really cool and um i'll have some questions I have one question already, especially I remember talking to you a few years ago in Zagreb, right? Um, and I was thinking about all this, um, including more um, master students and stuff. And you really mentioned like, okay, you really need the articles to get into um, scientific papers so that actually the data you collect become evidence. Because if not, it's still this missing link between um, data and like enough proven to get into some position right um but for instance like getting a lot of data by citizen science like do you see that as an opportunity to collect more data and how do you make sure that things get enough value so they can really make a difference i mean citizen science is uh, is now really booming and and it's it's a i would say a crucial part so like even if you do have a huge amount of science in any country which is usually not the case but uh, it's impossible to be in, in so many places. Uh, and and, and uh, even if you just want to monitor uh, some uh, species or you want to monitor the health of the river or whatever, it's much better off you develop a very robust uh, social uh, system which will monitor it. And then when you pinpoint the, the problematic areas, then actually for this final confirmation, you can always send in the, the, the experts to just confirm. So in a sense, if you are, let's say, looking for clues how to protect a certain area, you could send in hundreds of people into this area uh, to try to detect, you, you can of course tell them, you know, we are looking for this kind of animals or for this or for this. And uh, then they will tell you, oh, we found, I don't know, maybe a, a special species of butterfly that appears on this uh, uh, side arms of the, of the, and you can always check it now. I mean, through the photographs, you can send it to the expert and at the end, the expert can go there and really find it out, find out. But it's impossible that you will have enough resources to send scientists to go track the all the rivers and all the areas uh, in the country. Yeah. Cool. Does anyone else have a question to, to Sean at the moment? Because if not, we might first go to three girls and then we still have some time to ask questions if something pops up in the meanwhile. Um, for this moment, thanks already a lot to Sean. I think we'll yeah. be discussing it a bit later. Um, but since it's already 20 to 7, um, let's go to Amberlin now. Right? And maybe you can say a bit how you decided to structure it, because I think the three of you talked a bit more today. Uh, yes, uh, hello, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dushan, for this presentation. That was very interesting. Um, so we are three students and we are working from a distance uh, on the Sava. Uh, me, Constance and Maike. Uh, Maike will share the screen and I will, we will say next. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Can you see the screen now? I see myself. See yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, then we'll go here. And then how do I do this again? Where do I click? Slideshow. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> 
Okay, so we are um, trying to understand the relations between the people and the river, its cultural services, and how it the political stage. Um, so uh, the political stage is very uh, interesting right now because of what you may know is happening in Slovenia. So the Slovenian government is... is there... Wait, sorry, that's my roommate. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can mute yourself for the moment and then we don't hear that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will, I will start. So, yes, so the Slovenian government is taking advantage of the COVID-19 situation to pass a series of law that would make uh, some uh, building, uh, the construction of some facilities easier, such as uh, hydropower plants. Uh, without taking into account uh, environmental defenders into the decision-making process. Uh, so there's been some peaceful protests and a call for email uh, to the members of the parliament. And the petition has been launched, which is Narave uh, Nedamo, sorry for the pronunciation, which means uh, we won't give up on nature. Uh, so in my research, uh, next, um, Yes, in my research, I am trying to understand the conflict dimension that comes out uh, of hydropower plants project on the Sava River. Uh, next, uh, my assumption is that the conflict comes from three social representation of the river. The, the first one is anthropocentric, that is to say that rivers are, uh, should be useful for humans. So as you may guess, uh, this representation is in favor of the hydropower plants project. Uh, uh, so this posture may concern uh, mostly uh, financiers or sometimes the state, but it's not always the case, of course. Um, the second uh, representation is an ecocentric, which is that the waterway is a natural infrastructure that should be used, that ca can be used, but that uh, should be preserved. And the last one is a biocentric, uh, oh, and for the ecocentric, the water framework directive from the European Union, is a, is a good example. And the last one is a biocentric uh, representation, which is that rivers should stay wild and untouched. So <clears throat> next, so there's a conflict over the same space territory and these different representations overlap and they come into action. So I will make a case study uh, around the Mokriche uh, hydropower plant, which was stopped. Uh, so there's been a conflict between the Slovenian Native Fish Society, which filed a lawsuit against the, co the investing company HESS. So as we can see, uh, the Native Fish Society may share some values uh, of how the river should be used and some representation. And there are many other values that we can uh, be explored and that would lead us to Constance's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Anneline. So next. <laughs> Again, next. Yeah. So, well, there are all the values. That's why I came with this question. No, yeah, perfect. Why does the Sava River matter to you? That's the first question I ask myself in my master thesis. Is it the opportunity to be in close contact with the natures? Is it the possibility to practice your favorite activities, to learn from the nature, or simply the beauty of the landscape? So the aim of my thesis is to gain deep understanding of the values, the cultural services that local communities and visitors that are familiar with the Sava River obtain from this ecosystem. To answer this question, I'm, I use the citizen sciences, so I conduct interviews and based on these interviews, I came with the questionnaires. Um, I will have shared the link of the questionnaire on the chat. Um, so next. Oh, next slide. I... <laughs> Mike? Yeah, perfect. So I had this first question. The second I asked in my questionnaire is, what are your favorite places along the Sava River? So the participants of the questionnaire, they're able to map um, in a case study, 
places they liked based on points, polygons or lines, so different way of representing places they yeah, important for them and say in few words why well, they're important. And I will relate that to the cultural services that I deal in my thesis. Next slide. Yeah, so that's the case study I looked at. It's located north of Ljubljana. It's a transect of 60 kilometers. So what is interesting about um, these case studies that eight dams are plan to be built. So you can see with this orange dot. And um, this project are really source of process from the public and NGOs as mentioned before and by Amblin. And usually it's also because the voice of the public are not really taken into account in this project. So with my thesis I, I would like to give the public the opportunity to show why rivers are important to them that they are not only good at electricity, that they have a lot of values and also that by locating places of interest we could see that certain places could be at the same uh, location that dams have planned to be built and the, these values can be threatened these places can be destroyed and they have to be preserved so by collecting data we can have a better understanding of the values of the sava reduce conflict of interests if possible and if you if you um, if you think, if you are familiar with this place, I will be really happy if you could answer my questionnaire. And what is, make me happy already that I published it all, all two days and I got already 36 answers. So it's pretty going well, pretty going well so far. Thanks. Just a real quick uh, um, insight there. Constance was a bit afraid whether she would be able to get 40 um people <laughs> right and now it's already 36 and like that's super cool congrats and yeah well we'll talk about it later mike first <laughs> yeah uh can you hear me um wait i don't know if you say yes can you hear me yes okay <laughs> this is very difficult okay um i hope my roommates are not gonna drill uh, into the wall again um okay so yeah um co-creating riverscapes is the title of my thesis and um so constance is collecting these cultural values she was just talking about to have a bigger view of um of the different values that exist um and as became clear from Umbelin's research all these different visions can be conflicting and in my research i'm trying to zoom in into a deeper level regarding these personal values uh, to understand where these values come from um and how they are uh how they developed um so it's a strange idea that i think that we would have been sitting around a bonfire probably um and just talking about the river and what we've we have experienced um but i think that the stories that we were supposed to tell there um still exist and still are worthy of being shared and are really important in research um, so I want to talk about these stories and that's also my topic of my research. So I'm following um, the life course of five river defenders across the Balkans. So not only the Safa, but uh, three different locations. And my goal is to understand how their connection to nature developed, um, how that uh, human nature connection turned into feelings of care and protection for the river. And then also how we together envision uh, the future. Um, yeah, and I want to start off with a quote by Donna J. Haraway. Um, it matters what matters we use to think other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what knots, not knots, what thoughts think thoughts, what ties tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. So you probably will need to read this quote a couple more times. Um, but she, what she's actually describing is that how we and our visions and our opinions are entangled in our past and our present and our future. Um, so essentially context matters. Um, where we're going and where we are from matters in how we frame the world around us. Um, 
so I want to share the stories of river defenders in my thesis to tell the story of the river. Um, yeah, and nowadays in policy and research, we we sometimes seem to forget that we are dealing with real people. And I think everyone deserves a stage to share their vision, including nature. Um, but without the voice of nature, we need the river defenders to actually say what, what nature needs to be said. Um, yeah, so I think stories and personal experiences, emotional connections to nature, um, and also knowledge about nature have the power to expand the capacities of humans to care and protect for nature. So I have to click next. Um, and this same author, Donna J. Haraway, she uses the uh, concept responsibility, um, which is not just responsibility, which is being blamed or praised for something you do, but it's really about having the capacity to respond to issue and to challenges um, and she argues and that's also what i do in my research that we need personal experiences to be able to respond to develop the capacity to respond the ability to respond um, yeah so in my thesis i'm proposing alternative methods um, to gain understanding in why people value the river so much and why they um, turn this feeling of valuation into protection and care. Um, and I think this is necessary to bring more values onto the political stage. Um, so that's my personal thesis. Um, and this question is the question that Constance uh, Ombelin and I, in, in collaboration with Vera uh, and Anna, um, we came up with this question how can the personal stories and values of and about rivers be highlighted in a more effective and all-inclusive way onto the political stage um, so this question is about has, has something uh, from all of our researches um, and we're still doing our research so the final answer isn't there yet and it's also a very complicated question uh, but so far, um, we have seen that all these different values and services that the river pr provides can result in conflict. That's something we see happening nowadays in Slovenia very much. Um, and we have tried to collect and present um, more cultural services than are normally presented. That's also what Constance has been doing a lot. Um, and by showing new ways and new methods and new approaches of how you can um, understand which values exist. Um, we hope to pr propose new, uh, new insights in uh, what else should be cared for and what else should be involved in policy, for example. Um, and you can also see this happening um, nowadays in, um, by, with the protests in Ljubljana that um, so many values are not being valued in policy that now bottom-up initiatives have started to just go against the current government. Um, yeah, and by listening uh, to these personal stories, I think we will gain more understanding and comprehension um, of each other. And hopefully we will be able to act in a more uh, responsible way with everyone around us. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, yeah, I'm oh wondering if you have questions and if you understand everything. <laughs> if you mind leaving your screen open for a little bit. Yeah, with the question, sure. Because I think yeah. it's good to leave it. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, we've been just talking to Tushan also a lot, who's using, I think, scientific research to kind of get people on the policy that's already um, in place, uh, or at least the uh, the documents that are already in place to make sure that we at least keep to them, right? For instance, UNESCO World Heritage or um, other protected sites. Um, Dushan, how do you think this kind of research can actually help answering this question? And how do you think those goals could help saving the SAVA? Which research uh, well, thank you, Ombelin, Constance and Maike. Uh, I mean, this is really, really important because uh, the main problem you usually face is when you you know, you, you do something 
really good and, and, and you start something smart. And, but then you come into a real life and you meet these people who live there next to the river. And, uh, you know, they have their lives as well and they live differently and they expect stuff from somebody to tell them some really, you know, in, you know, interesting and, and, and intelligent stuff, uh, how they will live better. Uh, not just to hear from the politicians, which, I mean, in sense, they usually don't trust. Uh, but I would say the best way to convey these messages, to, to empower people, is, is through this kind of, uh, you know, you do some basic uh, research, you, you confront people with this, you check what they think about it, and, and then you can actually have a really nice message that can be brought back to the people. So if you ask them, you know, what is the most uh, valuable place for you, it doesn't have to be that it will be some really valuable, valuable place that we consider it. Uh, it could be a place, uh, I don't know, where they, uh, some kind of small forest where they could sit privately, or it could be a part of the, the river where it is uh, like a small park or something, but they need to tell you where it is. So in a sense, you do need to get that data from them. So, I mean, it's really, I would say, perfect thing uh, that you need in, in this uh, region, in Savariv. It's not just Slovenia. It's, uh, I would say, anywhere if you go Slovenia, Croatia, or, or, or Bosnia and Herzegovina, or Serbia, you need to have this strong uh, connection to the people because they are very sensitive to this. If you are doing something and you don't consult them, uh, like you are working behind their back, so in this way, as much as you can get them involved inside, they will be on board with your message. So even if sometimes like you are presenting them, we need to conserve the river and not build the bad dams. So even though if uh, before that they were maybe pro dams, they were actually saying, okay, but you know, we do need electricity and, and in a sense, we cannot all live in the dark. But if you explain to them that like, uh, you know, we will not live in the dark, it doesn't mean that. It actually doesn't mean that we'll now need to cl close everything and, and not use electricity. Uh, it actually just means that we will be smarter in cho choosing where we will do it. And we will just be smarter with which technology we'll do it. And then we can protect that little forest where you, I don't know, for the first time kiss the girl or something like that. So like a place that's valuable for you. And then they will understand. Then, then he will say, okay, now it's my personal interest to, to help with this cause because it's a, I will be a part of a bigger deal. And then they will actually start to raise their own little group of people, like independently from you. Like, you know, you will empower them as well to stand in, uh, you know, front of, uh, in front of uh, uh, bulldozers and stuff like that. And this is, I would say, the key. Getting to hear what they say and then em empower them just to do what they would in any case do because i would say that everybody has this love for nature in in their hearts and everybody <laughs> when you are stressed you you will go to a forest or next to a river nobody will go i don't know to a main square in the city to relax sorry that's maybe too far with the, the conclusion um does anyone have any questions to either of these people that were speaking Maybe we can stop sharing screen now so we can see each other. Um, oh, I would just say one more thing. <laughs> so if uh, really, if anybody's uh, really interested in expanding the research, well, especially the three of you that already do it in Slovenia. So, I mean, we can offer some, uh, you know, basic resources to expand it to Croatia. It would really be interesting, like, uh, you know, just a little bit downstream, you have this beautiful nature park, Lonsko Polje, and then further down, Sava is really beautiful. And, and uh, I would say that, all three of your research could be really, really valuable to find out, uh, you know, to expand it. Maybe use Slovenia for now as like a, a core, but then at least try to expand a bit more. And if we can help in any way, please contact me. So we can even try to help to find some resources. Well, we do have some of them and we can help find what's, what's missing. That is cool. I think I, I something actually the whole Sava, right? But now you're limited to this case study because of Yeah, we, we had this we had the case study in Lonsko Poyo actually. That was uh, one of the three case studies we had. And because of the time it takes to find contacts, 
well, basically online and searching on Facebook groups and also the language issue. And the inter in Slovenia, there are a lot of protests. So now it's really the good time to come with our research. But in other places like Lonsopoyo, it's a national park. So around there are not a lot of big cities and it's difficult to find people to relate with, to could share it around in all the places in maybe village our research, it was really infeasible in a master thesis of limited time. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I mean, time. but uh, we would definitely offer the help in this part. Uh, I mean, in sense, especially the language barrier. And uh, I mean, I have lots of students that, uh, that uh, could join in. I mean, like we did have uh, a few examples like this, that there was some uh, higher uh, like European level questionnaires or like research that was done. And then if it is uh, done in a good way so that like the data collection and like visits can be done uh, by students, they are very often very interested in doing their like extended uh, bachelor or master thesis. And uh, we also have at least uh, five, six uh, international students every year. So like, well, that, that's a little bit problematic because of the language barrier, but uh, in a sense, it can be done that like two people together or something like that, and then still to collect this kind of uh, data. Well, the, the help is offered. So if you have any ideas, just, yeah. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> I that's think we'll keep myself. that in mind when we plan the next master thesis. That um, I think with the thesis is also always the limitation of, of time, so you have to focus on something specifically if you want to finish within half a year. Um, but I think now we have quite a lot of momentum and new people coming in, being interested, and I think we can really think about expanding these projects and um, applying it to different case studies and. Um, trying to get to upscale the whole thing, eventually maybe also get some funding and not just have master students working on it. But. Well, that, that's as well something that maybe, you know, we could help. We live from funding that comes from different sources. So like in sense of uh, uh, places where funding could be asked, uh, we do have some possible uh, possibilities and, and maybe even, you know, to include it in some of the existing uh, projects. I mean, the, th the thing is, there's always money. So uh, the ideas is something that's usually not so, so common. So like good ideas, I, from my experience, very easily get funding and, and, and money. And especially for international uh, subjects, so like if there is more countries involved, uh, it should be quite, uh, quite easy to, to, to get the, I would say even bigger funding or very, we didn't have any application from uh, any student that actually at the end didn't get covered, so. Cool, that's good to know. I think we'll be in touch for all you. Sounds like a good connection made here tonight. <laughs> um, I'm excited about it. Is there any questions from any other part of the world? We've been really focused on the Balkans at the moment, but this is obviously quite related to things that happen somewhere else. If not also, okay, Imari? Uh, hello, um, I come from um, more like anthropology and cultural studies. Um, and I uh, have two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for all of your talks. It was amazing and I learned so much. Um, my first question would be for Dujan. Um, and I wanted to ask you as I'm, as I, um, come from like critical border and migration uh, studies. Um, I wanted to ask you whether you could share some material on the migration of fish, because what I plan to do for my master thesis is to connect migration and ecology along the Viosa River. So to, to find out about um, looking through the river to find out more about migration and see migration not only as like human migration, but also on a um, more symmetrical layer like different types of migration. Um, and my second question um, would be um, to Maike, because um, the quote you uh, from Haraway you had in the beginning is exactly like something I have in mind when I think about the river. And um, I read lots of her books and I just wanted to ask whether we can connect maybe to speak about that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, from my point as well, I will, I, 
I can send you some very general because as much as I understand you want to compare in a sense human migration with uh, some migrations in the animal kingdom if I understood well or or I didn't okay well I can send you the part on the on the animal kingdom no help on human part uh, I can say that there is no human settlements where there is no uh, water and protein. So actually the rivers are really the, the bloodstream of, of, of humankind. So no possibility. And we can see this in, our, uh, in the karstic areas where you have very scarce resources uh, on the matter of food and, and water as well. So again, water providing the food as well. Yeah, that would be great to have some material. And yes, for the for the human migration, I think I have my basis. But now I want to yeah rethink it through um, non-human migration. Yes, no problem. I, I can share. And even you know, we have some really interesting uh, new records which uh, show that uh, uh, you had f uh, human settlements uh, actually found. Uh, intentionally in places where you had the combination of two so just having water or just having protein is actually uh, was was not enough so you had even development of some endemic ecosystem services like uh, people harvesting uh, only cave dwelling fish in these really dry karstic areas so like there is no there was nothing that they could grow there and so you just had these karstic springs and only this uh, one species of fish living there and they would actually make a settlement and manage to survive just because there was protein and water together. Thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, sorry for that guys, I was moved out of a room. I'm staying with some friends helping building their house. Um, but the baby had to go to sleep in the room that I was <laughs> using. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to remind you all again that we're still having our applications open for the students for Rivers Camp in Montenegro. Because as Mike mentioned, it's actually the kind of stories that develop on next to a campfire. And we're hopeful, like really hopeful that we can do it and that we can come together in September. Um, so if you look at our website, we even put some scenarios in case stuff cannot go on as we hope. So um, have, a, have a look um, and share with whomever would be interested. Um, yeah, that's it then for today, I think. Um, and you're all very welcome to join in next week again. Let me see who we have actually. Oh uh, yeah, it's gonna be a really cool one, I think actually. It's uh, Duke Le Chille. he's gonna talk about forest and rain. So kind of linking the river to all the area beside it, right? So um, that sense the energy of a river, it doesn't stop at the river, that it just continues around it um, and how um, dependent we actually are on the whole ecosystem in that sense. Cool. Um, yeah, make sure you have that email address before we leave because I think as soon as mm -hmm. Semra is going to close this conversation, you're going to have lost, but we're going to upload it. Um, thanks all for joining. I really enjoyed and I uh, hope to see you next week. And yeah, that's it from my side.